The last speaker of the symposium uh, is uh, actually uh, Kent uh, Larsen. He will uh, talk about uh, entrepreneurial high-performance livable cities. Uh, since uh, 2001, Kent Larsen directs the Sci City Science Initiative and the Changing Places Group at the MIT Media Lab in Boston. His research focusing on, focuses on developing urban interventions that enable more entrepreneurial, livable, high-performance districts in cities. Projects include advanced simulation and augmented reality for urban design, transformable microhousing for millennials, mobility on demand systems that create alternatives to private automobiles, and living lab deployments in Hamburg, Andorra, Taipei, Lisbon, and Boston. He, uh, he and his uh, researchers of his group received the 10 year impact award from uh, Ubicom in uh, 2014. And that's an award that apparently with the benefit of insight, can say something about the largest impact uh, that uh, has had. And before uh, joining MIT, I understood that you practiced for 15 years uh, architecture in New York City, and that was even a book uh, written by Kent that was selected as a test best, the, uh, best test book on architecture uh, by the New York Times uh, Review of Books. Um, so I'm very interested in uh, hearing what you're going to talk, talk to us about uh, livable cities. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you. So you mentioned the book. I, this is, uh, I, I, I have an opportunity, because we're talking about light, to go back to this book I wrote 20 years ago that I never talk about anymore. But it was, um, it was a very presumptuous idea. How many of you know Louis Kahn? one of the great architects of the 20th century. Actually, he's one of the great architects' architects. When I was in school, I, I loved his work, but he left, he, he, was a, uh, he was very hard to work with. He left a lot of unbuilt works, and um, a lot of things were started but never finished. This, he, he left sketches like this, and this was to be the great synagogue of the world, the Herva Synagogue in Jerusalem, and it had the, these Jerusalem stone pillars and a whole concrete inner sanctuary and light would come down through these cracks. I always wondered how this would be experienced. And I knew some of the great architectural historians at Nukon, they didn't have a clue. <laughs> and so I decided to finish the design. And at the time I was using this kind of experimental radiosity lighting simulation software the, but the idea was to try to understand how these spaces might have been perceived. So it was really a photographic essay, the book was, of uh, unbuilt works that nobody had ever seen. So you see here's the shaft of light coming down and trying to look at the materials and the layering of spaces. And uh, I'll only show a few of these images. That was uh, the synagogue. He did the Salk Institute in La Jolla, a very famous building. But an unbuilt part of it had the same idea. It's ruins wrapped around buildings. So here, rather than Jerusalem stone, he wrapped these travertine structures around concrete cylinders that were the occupied space. And so what was interesting is trying to figure out how all this complex interreflected sunlight would mediate the space create this mediated space between the glare of the ocean and the darker interior space. So it was kind of a lighting screen. And I had great fun studying the lighting impact uh, of these screens on that interior space. And then he did the uh, mem uh, memorial to six million martyrs. Very different. Rather than interreflected light, it was about uh, refraction. So these were designed as concrete block buildings, nobody really knew how, to, how that might have been experienced. So I created these images that was trying to, trying to look at this complex lighting effects. Anyway, that was 20 years ago. I did the book, when I finished the book, I said never again will I do that kind of work. And I went on to the work I want to talk about today. Um, and that's uh, focused on cities, particularly cities and innovation. And we've been, Thinking about cities and innovation, and this is one way to look at that, it's, it's venture funding that flows to cities. And if you, if you see here, most of that funding goes to the coasts of the U.S., uh, to northern Europe, and to some cities in Asia. So the world is not flat with respect to innovation. Uh, just for fun, because we just, have you guys heard about our election? Yeah. <laughs> 
We just had an election. And I, this is a, I just made these actually on the airplane coming here. This, this is where all the venture funding is. And if you map that to the election results, everywhere there's a concentration of venture funding was deep blue Hillary Clinton cities. And in fact, she won all the cities, more than 500,000 people. And as you get to smaller cities and rural, it became increasingly Trump. So actually, well, I think one of the challenges here is to fill in some of these gaps and, and deal with the equity issues. Anyway, I'm not here to talk about politics. We can do that after if you want. Innovation uh, districts. Many mayors are thinking about what enables innovation. They want to create innovation districts where they can concentrate creative activity. Most mayors don't, I, I would venture to say all mayors, don't really understand in any deep way what enables innovation in cities. We've been trying to figure that out. And in the end, we think it comes down to social ties. It's about, this is a study that one of my colleagues did at the Media Lab, mapping workplace. They wore these uh, sociometers that could tell uh, the quality of engagement between people and interaction, and then mapped these social networks. This person's a super networker. This person is more in isolation. The people that are connected, that have strong and deep social ties, tend to be the most innovative and productive. And we think the same thing applies at the scale of the city. We tend to, we don't work at the scale of the city, though, sorry. We work at the scale of a district in the city. Those kind of districts are the roughly the size of a medieval city, like central um, Amsterdam, or even the center here of Eindhoven, roughly one square kilometer. Those are, I think, that, we think that's the essential scale to work at. And, the, and the, the key variables that we're looking at are density, proximity, diversity. Density defined very broadly, density of workplaces and residential density, et cetera. Proximity, getting all the pieces in the right place, and diversity is a mix of people with different backgrounds that share ideas, and then you can put all that together by dealing with a more rational, evidence-based, data-driven design process on the one hand, and on the other hand, dealing particularly with mobility systems and housing for equity that brings people together in compact, walkable communities. And we think if you could do that, then the innovation potential goes up, livability goes up, public health goes up because people are more active in walkable communities and resource consumption goes down. So this is basically our entire research agenda of my group at the Media Lab. So I would just want to now talk about in some detail how we're dealing with that. CityScope is a tangible design decision-making platform. We think of it as a real-time data-driven urban simulation platform for decision-making and community engagement. We started about five years ago doing this using Lego bricks. We love Legos. They're, Lego's one of our sponsors. And in this case, we use color-coded bricks where yellow was retail, black was housing, white was office, et cetera. We allowed us to put these things together very quickly. And then we realized that we could use augmented reality to uh, take this to the next level. So we started building models, and this is a little bit of our journey, our thinking process. So we started building models out of white Lego bricks and then projecting onto them uh, different uh, types of visualization, like this is land use. Yellow is, is where the housing is. Kendall Square is quite dysfunctional in that hardly anybody lives there. It's very little housing, even though it's considered the prototypical urban innovation district in the world. Uh, these are the mobility modes, solar radiation, wind flow, all these things can be simulated. But then we started taking less typical data sets for visualization, like we want to know where the money is flowing. And here we're looking at uh, venture capital and biotech funding, et cetera. That's the Cambridge Innovation Center with 650 startups. So you can see that this is a hotspot of entrepreneurial activity. Where are young people active? It's very hard to get a data set that will describe activities of young people, so, but we, we looked at a geolocated Twitter feed. So here the student sends a tweet using hashtag CityScope. The media lab lights up. You see the tweet down here, and we can then draw heat maps over different periods of time. So this is where all the restaurants are. Media lab is bright. 
and uh, the artificial intelligence lab is bright. This is a US government building there that's not bright. And then we look at uh, ways that people can interact with the model. We're particularly interested in sophisticated tools that non-experts can use. So here she's flying what we call a view cube. It's the drone-like object. You can fly over a physical model and then, and then see the perceptual uh, rendering. Okay, but then we thought we, we weren't pushing it far enough because it was too hard to change these models. We needed something that was more interactive. So we started using these optically tagged elements in the model that where each element can be a database. The, the first time we tried this was in Riyadh. They were redeveloping a one square kilometer district in their city. Most redevelopment projects are roughly that scale. And this interface was very simple. Red, bad, green, good. And here... You can see there's a park in the center. This is looking at walkable access to parks. That's not so good. And you can then toggle through layers of visualization. We were doing daylighting, access to daylighting, energy, walkable access to parks, from housing to workplaces, workplaces to housing, et cetera. And I'll come back to a little bit of that when I talk about the cities where we're working. Uh, the second system that we think is so critical is moving away from private automobiles to more shared systems because then that gets rid of parking and traffic congestion and allows an increase of density without the problems that come with density, typically an increase in vibrancy and human interaction, and that uh, will increase the innovation potential, we, bl we believe. So in a district, we think these are most of the most important modes, mobility modes to be thinking of. This is by far the most important walkability that happens to be a laneway in Melbourne. Uh, shared bikes, on-demand shuttles, and then we've worked on a number of vehicles where we actually build prototypes. The ones in the red boxes are the, one, are the vehicles that we have actually built and experimented with. And I'll take you through our thinking. We, we started by trying to develop a better car for the city, thinking about what does the city need. And we worked on this project uh, for almost 10 years, called the City Car. It had four innovations. One was um, robot wheels, drive-by wire robot wheels. So drive motor steering, braking suspension in each wheel. You get rid of engines and transmissions so you can fold the chassis so it occupies very little space. It's direct, step out directly to the curb and you see you can get three of these in one parallel parking space. Uh, we, like I say, like to, like to build things. So we prototyped this, tested it in northern Spain, in the Basque region. It had all of those innovations. You see there's a yoke here that pivots left and right. You can drive it in Paris and London the same day. And we thought this was great. Got a lot of press about it. We, won, we launched this at the EU headquarters in, in Brussels. The Barossa presided over it, gave us an award. And then I decided it's still a car. We wanted to get rid of cars. And... Um, particularly private cars. So we started thinking more about shared autonomous vehicles. So then we built a fully functional half-scale prototype. But the idea here was if, a, if a autonomous vehicles are interacting with people, you, it needs to communicate its intention. So here we're trying to use light and eye contact and pupil dilation. Of course, here the headlights are the pupils uh, to then have the vehicle signal that it recognizes you and it's safe to pass in front of it, etc. Since the vehicle folded, we could actually put the vehicle in a more submissive position to defer to the pedestrian. So that was pretty interesting. But it still was a car. So we decided to even go farther to do a more bike-like vehicle. The problem with bicycles is the demographic profile, particularly in American cities, is quite narrow. It's mostly young men who ride in bike lanes in the Netherlands, it's much more diverse. Nonetheless, with a three-wheeler, disabled people, elderly people can ride. It's protected from the rain to a certain extent, so you can ride in a bike lane wearing a business suit or uh, et cetera and, and um, be somewhat protected. Then ultimately, we thought the, the, the three features we had to bring together was autonomy, shared use, and electric drive. So we... And we 
we thought, well, what, how could we have impact in the short term? Most car companies, like Google Cars up here, full autonomy driving in all conditions, we decided, let's work down here driving in bike lanes. And so basically we wanted to create an autonomous bicycle, or in this case, a tricycle, although we are working on an autonomous bicycle right now. And we launched this at the commun uh, Consumer Electronics Show last January. We'll be back this year with a new mo model. And uh, here the message here, this was from an article, the message here is that autonomous vehicles are not scary, in fact they're quite practical and can help the planet. We wanted to, this to be a very gentle looking vehicle, almost like a baby carriage that could interact with pedestrians in a, in a, in a city center, for example. We're using some fairly low cost technology like computer vision to recognize bike lanes, low-cost la laser scanner to recognize three-dimensional objects. We're trying to bring the cost of the technology down to about $500, so it's, it, it would be practical in a vehicle like this. It's like a driverless, bike-like Uber system that comes to you wherever you are. You can drive it, we don't care. That's not the purpose of the autonomy, although if you're disabled, it can, you can use it in autonomy mode and then get out of it wherever you are and it goes on its way. We um, tested it last month in Andorra where we have a little project. Here it is in one of the plazas. And, um, but then if it's shared use, you design the fleet size to meet the demand at rush hour for people, then off-peak you have excess vehicles, so they just move packages autonomously. So we, we're looking at dealing with both um, people moving and goods. And uh, to, to connect it to light, I think the most important, um, potentially, way of communicating the vehicle's intent to the pedestrians is through the use of, of light and color changing and other things like that. So that's an interesting project for me that we're, that we're focused on. We, we like to build these prototypes and then model them. So this is Kendall Square, where MIT is. Everything in red here is a parking lot. You can see that an unbelievable amount of land is wasted to parking in cities. It's just criminal. We have to get away from that. And so we, we then got taxi data, and we modeled the movement of vehicles using uh, real data, uh, uh, model the private vehicles that are currently be, being used, and then we simulated the impact of shared use. So you see all these white boxes now can be used for other features because you provide mobility with uh, many fewer vehicles and get rid of the parking. But the big advantage is when you go to shared autonomous vehicles. Now what we're looking at right here is you see the purple areas that's indicating infrastructure in the city that can communicate with the vehicles and a, and a logical way to do that is to put additional sensing on lampposts like what Philip makes, Philips make, and, uh, and do uh, location of vehicles, location of people, the ability to see comprehensively in the city what the context is and communicate that information to the shared autonomous vehicles that then can be uh, potentially more robust and, and far less expensive. So this is an area of research we hope to get into uh, in some detail over the next year or two. Uh, the other project we're working on is we call City Home. This is hyper-efficient housing to increase the density in cities, the affordability, the vibrancy. Uh, many mayors, well, if you talk to them, mayors of the major cities, they'll say one of their greatest challenges is to keep the creative people in the city, that, you know, artists, young people, because the cities where these people most want to live and work are getting priced out of the market. This is Mayor Bloomberg advocating a little micro-unity, standing in the floor plan of that. It's a very terrible apartment, I think, because the bed dominates it, almost no storage. So we decided to shrink it down to, in this case, a 19 square meter apartment and have triple the functionality using architectural robotics. So here uh, one has a larger bed, a queen size bed, an office for six people, a dining room for six people, no, um, a large living room, etc. The idea here, the big idea, is this is, in my opinion, the next step of the Internet of Things. It's not just 
devices that are connected and smart. It's bringing together those ele smarter elements to create the environments where we live and work and creating a path to market for these kind of, um, these kind of solutions in a very cost-effective way. Uh, and we, and they, the students had fun playing with light. Uh, so in, in this kind of, the idea is developers build dumb loft spaces and then through smarter furniture that makes use of robotics and lighting and entertainment systems, you can bring these systems very um, cost effectively and robustly into the environment. Uh, we, we also launched a startup to commercialize this last year. Uh, and, and this is a little video we put out last month. So this shows a young woman waking up. She hits a button, her bed goes away, she can collapse her bedroom and have a much bigger living room. Um, and she has her entertainment systems, et cetera, integrating into it. We wanted to show that it's just normal. We have systems um, now in multiple places in Boston. This is an Airbnb apartment, so we've had 40 people stay in this apartment. We're collecting very rich data about the activities, and uh, we have lots of ideas for new systems here. Some of the current modules, but we're going to go to kitchens and bathrooms and, and complete modules in the future. So that's pretty exciting for us. We're all not just looking at lateral translation, but vertical translation. In this case, the bed goes up to the ceiling, the wall moves, and um, we, we then decided to prototype this as well, because just simulation's not enough. You want to actually do living lab experiments and prototype these things. So in this case, the light, or the bed, sorry, the bed goes down. And we map lighting actually to each of these positions. So we've been working on an interface, and we actually did use the hue here. The other, we, we just hacked LED lights, but here we were using hue. And um, so then one of the preferences is not just lighting preferences, um, but preferences for the physical state of the apartment that could be mapped to lighting and sound and, and other things. Uh, this is another prototype of a bed that we did that was kind of fun. In this case, it has a linen management system, these fins that can flip the linen out of the way when it goes up into the ceiling, so you don't even have to make your bed. Now. We do a lot of work in studying human behavior. We've built, uh, uh, this is our third generation of MIT environmental centered sensors, so we call them tear mites. And uh, we can sprinkle these sensors around the environment. Here you're just using a Tango tablet to get real-time data from them. Uh, we have a project with uh, IKEA. This is an apartment we worked with them on in Malmo, uh, where we had about 150 sensors, it's on every cabinet door and appliance and things, objects that people touch. This bouncing ball shows this, the sequence of sensor activations uh, while someone is fix, fixing a meal in the kitchen. So you see they never opened that cabinet. This was opened a lot because it has a big circle. This is even more. So this allows us to optimize these systems and understand in a very fine-grained way how people use the space. We did do a lighting project with these sensors about four years ago. This was in one of my lab spaces where we have it instrumented and we're doing activity recognition. We exaggerated the color in this case for the video, but it shows the, the, the lighting changing dynamically as he goes through different, different states. Um, we, we tested this in an office for a number of months it was pretty interesting. We also did the same thing with uh, sunlight. This is called a personalized sunlight project. So in a facade that has access to solar um, radiation, we put an articulating mirror. In this case, she has an app and she can map certain activities to the position of that shaft of sunlight. And then as she moves through the day with her activities, as, as long as the sun is up, this shaft of light follows her around in whatever position she, she uh, prefers. And then at night, the artificial lighting takes over. Uh, we're also interested in workplace environments uh, 
that are dynamic. This is a project we just finished a couple of weeks ago called, we, they called the Amoeba Wall. There's, they're actually lighting pan, panels that are robotic that brings both ambient light and space division into a co-working environment. And then urban agriculture. We also have a project called City Farm, which has evolved to, uh, to an open ag project, producing food at the point of consumption. This is a city farm that we built on the fifth floor of the Media Lab uh, a couple of years ago. And we're, uh, it I had a very interesting meeting today at Phillips uh, with the person working on their urban and agriculture project uh, using hydroponics. Here we're using, we're using aeroponics where the roots are misted with uh, nutrients and moisture. We have, um, we've just instrumented this like crazy. So every plant has instrumentation so we can collect data from every single plant. And we've now, we now have a project called the Foods Computer where we're building these food computers that have environmental control and lighting, et cetera, all aeroponics. And we're putting these in schools around and we, around the world right now and volunteers are using them. So the idea is to have this distributed network of farmers experimenting with new ways of producing food, sharing all the data that goes up to the cloud. So the data that everyone is creating, all the growing recipes, et cetera, are all available to everyone. And our vision is to have food produced near the point of consumption, maybe even in a cafeteria space like this. So in the few minutes I have left, I just want to talk about what we're doing in a few, in a few cities around the world. These are the cities where we're now working. We wanted to work on every continent, but we're now only working in North America, Northern Europe, uh, the Middle East, and Asia. Nothing in Africa or Latin America right as of yet. We hope to. Hamburg is one of our most interesting projects for me. Hamburg was, as many European cities were, were hit with the influx of refugees from the war. The mayor came to us and said, can you help us find sites to build housing for 20,000 refugees. And we said yes. <laughs> this is how the refugees are now being housed. I visited some of these sites uh, last spring. So what did, we, what did we do there? We built a number of big city scope tables. And the mayor had three criteria. He said, no ghettos. Everyone, all the immigrants need to be um, integrated into the community. Number two, uh, I'm not going to dictate where the housing gets built. This has to be a totally bottom-up community engagement process. You tell me. And, and number three, every district, rich and poor, has to share equally. So we built this big table, and you see the color-coded maps that could be swapped out showing the availability of sites and they're evaluated according to environmental regulations and zoning and land ownership, et cetera. And the people, uh, we, had, we did 44 workshops with 30 community groups. And uh, they would come in and focus on the district that they lived in. And the methodology we hit on was they collectively decide on what sites are of interest, put this square plastic piece on the table. That is a zoom window, but that enlarges that square on this table that has our optically tagged Lego pieces. And they then explore in an iterative way different scenarios. So the, they move these Lego pieces that re represent number of, number of um, dwelling units or um, amenities, et cetera. Uh, and we've found that it was a, an amazingly positive process. The oppositions to immigrants decreased dramatically. The community got involved. They, they made decisions in a way that even surprised the mayor. He was incredibly pleased with how positive this was. They, um, 
And at the, so you see a little bit of the process. We had to be very careful about filming it because they had a rule that we couldn't actually film the real community engaging in for privacy reasons. But at the end of the workshops, the table ends up something like this. Then the community goes back and they, they discuss their findings. These are all the districts. So you can see this district is doing pretty well. So that one needs to improve. And we actually got into some positive competition between the districts. Now we're focused on uh, one of the areas that will be um, become an innovation district that brings together young German entrepreneurs with creative refugees, entrepreneurial refugees. And by the way, the Syrian refugees in Germany start companies at a rate five times greater than the native Germans. So it's pretty interesting. The Atlantic uh, had an article last month on our project, Germany's radical pro-refugee urban planning experiment. And uh, I didn't think it was that radical, but it, actually in a way it is given that it's uh, a, a pretty dramatic alternative to the way things are normally done. In Andorra, we have a project that I'm quite excited about. Andorra is a little country between Spain and France and the Pyrenees. Here we have three years of telecom CDR data. We have all the Wi-Fi data, transportation data for the entire country, and we're visualizing this data. This was Cirque du Soleil happening here. Here's the traffic jam coming from the north from Toulouse. You can see the, the French people are in blue, the Spanish people are in orange. So we get this fine-grained uh, movement of people. Uh, one of the reasons we're doing this is we're now modeling our new mobility modes in the city to see if we can address some of their terrible traffic conditions. We are, um, we built a large city scope model in, of Andorra. And if you notice right here, there's a grid. These are our optically tagged uh, elements. So let me show you what we did with that. Uh, Andorra's Catalan, as is Barcelona, where I was yesterday. Um, we abstracted Barcelona, a neighborhood in Barcelona that I think is a pretty good model, into 16 blocks, each block with 16 of our Lego pieces. And then we modeled young people in blue, millennials, mid-career in yellow, more senior people in red. And uh, we built an agent-based model to try to see how these diverse communities, di diverse by age, might interact. So here they're moving micro units from the cheap part of the city down into the center of the district and you can get a visual sense of blue and red and yellow interacting. So we build a series of these tools. One of them is, these are the metrics, diversity, density, we can look at all, you know, traffic, energy, we can look at lighting, different things. And so these metrics get updated in real time. This is looking at uh, land use scenarios. So RS is residential small, those are micro units. RL is residential luxury, those are, that's housing for rich people. We can then move one of these types into a slot and dynamically tune the density of each. And you can see the density of that, uh, in that case, the people that are mapped to red increasing. And as we tune the density, we can get a visual sense of where these people would occupy the city. And we're also interested then in going back to this conceptual input, tangible input system and more of a perceptual way of visualizing the city. So as the density is tuned, you get a sense of the impact on the city in real time. And this, just for fun, it's a digital mirror. So this looks like it's actually a real mirror, but that's a digital mirror that's tracking the um, eyes of the person looking at it. So I'll just end, end with this. I, I put my camera when I was last in Amsterdam on a garbage can and just let it run because I loved this scene in Amsterdam. It shows uh, cars, yes, there are cars here. It shows bicycles. Okay, you see the tram going by and you see people, but fundamentally it's about people and it's about human interaction. So this is a nice example of how we can design a city for this kind of uh, creative human interaction. 
uh, rather than the way we normally design a city, which is by privileging machines and cars. And so I think we're trying to get back to those, those kind of first principles based on human interaction. Thank you. Thank you.